Um, we've got seven DRB members here and i um, glad to also see our applicants and some members of the public as well. So thanks to everybody for logging on um, before the meeting so we can iron, we could iron things out. It's fine to participate with just audio. Um, and if you'd like to participate with video, that is also an option. So um, my name is Kate McCarthy. I'm the chair of the Montpelier Development Review Board, and I'm calling this meeting here on June 4th, 2021 to order. Thank you for being here. Um, what we're going to do next is review the procedures uh, for participating in this meeting, considering the format is what it is. And so for those procedures, I will turn to Meredith. Did you want me to do that before you introduced everybody or after? I forgot to introduce everybody, so after. So what I'm gonna do now is introduce everybody. Thanks, Meredith. A little rusty here after the holiday. Um, I'm gonna go in order on my screen and say, say the names of DRB members and give them a chance to introduce themselves. And I will start with Roger. Hello. And Abby. Hi, everyone. Kevin. Hello, everybody. Rob. Hello, everyone. Jean. Hello. Jean. And Michael. Good evening. Good evening. All right. Thank you. Thank you all for your introductions. And now we'll we'll talk about the uh, remote meeting procedures and process, or rather, Meredith will. Okay. Give me one second. I'm going to share my screen and get this going. Oh. All right. So. Um, this is a lot of this is for people who are viewing via ORCA, um, as well as for people who've never attended a DRB meeting before. Um, for those of you who are on the Zoom meeting right now, if you're having issues with your audio, um, please note here's my email address right here down at the bottom. So feel free to shoot me an email if you're having any issues. You can also use the chat function, but if you can't figure that out, you can shoot me an email. Um, so. For those who are watching via ORCA, um, you can participate in this meeting if you choose by joining the Zoom meeting using this link here, um, or you can call in using this number, and here's the meeting ID and password. Um, and do, 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 do. you can also download, I'll go back to this in a minute, um, you can also download the meeting materials here. Though of course I just realized I'm not sure how to go backwards. Give me a second. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't have done it that way. Um, I'll, I'll go back to the meeting materials link in a minute. Um, so this Zoom meeting is being recorded as well as streamed live. Um, turning your video on is optional, as Kate noted. Public testimony tonight will be taken verbally, um, although you can also shoot me an email, and I can always, at the end of testimony from people who are actually present, I can read that into the record if need be, if you're having issues getting through. Um, uh, chat function should only be used for troubleshooting or logistics questions. Please keep your microphone on mute when you're not speaking to reduce background noise. If you're participating by phone, star six will allow you to mute and unmute, and we'll actually see that in the Zoom that you're muted. Um, if you're interested in speaking on a particular matter, please raise your hand physically if we can actually see you in the video. Alternatively, if you're on the phone, you can press star nine and that'll create a little hand raise signal on the Zoom so the rest of us can see that. Um, and then once the chair has recognized you to participate, participate, if you're not one of the applicants, please um, make sure that once you've unmuted your microphone and confirmed that you've been heard, that you provide your full name and address for the record. This lets us send you the decision um, at the end of the, when the decision has been made, it lets us send you a copy of that. Um, please, if you're providing question, having questions or comments as a member of the public, please try to keep those initial comments to two minutes. Um, the DRB members will then have the opportunity to respond or ask questions of you, um, and the applicant might have an opportunity to respond as well to the board. Um, and the chair can grant additional time for speakers who have follow-up questions or comments. When you're finished speaking, please make sure to mute your microphone again. And the chair will move on, but you can always pipe back up with additional questions, but please don't speak until the chair has recognized you. 
Um, if the public is unable to access this meeting, it will be continued to a time and place certain. If you're having connectivity issues, try turning off your video or closing other applications on your phone or computer. Um, and then if you're having, like I said, here is where you can link to the um, all the meeting materials. So if you're having trouble viewing the meeting materials you've called in via phone or something like that, you can always download the full meeting packet at that link. Please note that all votes taken during this meeting will be done by roll call vote. And I'll now hand this back over to the chair. All right, thanks, Meredith. Um, all right, so the next item on the agenda is the approval of the agenda. And um, before I entertain a motion for approving the agenda, I would like to note that item nine on our agenda includes um, the opportunity for a board and public discussion of a procedure we've been using here in Zoom land, um, which is deliberative session for all of our applications. That means we go into a separate Zoom that is not public to talk through the decisions. And we've been doing that to improve consistency of the decisions, to create solid conditions where necessary, and to smooth things out in the Zoomiverse here. So um, that is the last item on the agenda. So, but if it's okay with other board members, I'd like to inquire as to whether any of the, any members of the public are here for that issue. And um, if you are here to talk about that part of our procedure, could you please pipe up now by unmuting and saying you're interested in discussing it? Because if there are folks, I might like to move that up in the agenda. Is anyone here to talk about agenda item number nine, use of deliberative session? Okay, I wanted to pause just long enough to find buttons on phones and unmutes on computers. Um, hearing that nobody is on that, um, I think we can entertain, I would like to entertain a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Motion by Kevin, is there a second? A second. Second from Jean, is there any discussion? All right, I'll take the vote by roll. Roger? Yes. Abby? Yes. Kevin? Yes. Jean? Yes. Michael? Yes. Rob? Yes. And I also vote yes. So we've approved our agenda. Thank you. Uh, the next item on our agenda is comments from the chair. I don't have any comments. Um, and after that, we have the approval of minutes of our last meeting, which was December 21st. Um, there are four of us who were in attendance and eligible to vote. Roger, myself, Michael and Rob. Um, so are the, is there a motion to approve the minutes of December 21st? So moved. Motion by Roger. Second. Second by Michael, or was that Rob? Rob. Second by Rob, sorry. Um, all right, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Okay, of those eligible to vote, please, please vote yes or no. Uh, Roger? Yes. Michael? Yes. Rob? Yes. And I also vote yes. So we've adopted the minutes of December 21st. Thank you. So that brings us to our first agenda item, which is 7 Charles Street. It's a request for a second access, that is a second driveway to this duplex. So what we're going to do, what I'm going to do is swear in anyone who wants to be heard on this and then I'll have Meredith give an overview, and then we'll hear from the applicant who is also here. So um, I see that Tom Harries is here on 7 Charles Street. Is anyone else here to be heard on this application? Okay, in that case, I will swear in Tom. Um, if you'd please raise your right hand. Um, and I'll swear you in, Tom. Thanks. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury? Yes, I do. Great. Thank you very much. I uh, appreciate that. So I'll turn it over to Meredith, and then, Tom, you will have a chance to speak on your application as well. So, Meredith, if you could give us a brief overview, please. Will do. Um, I am going to keep this pretty brief. 
Um, as you said, this is an application for a second driveway um, for this parcel, and that's something that has to be approved by the Development Review Board. Um, and the second driveway would provide access to a second off-street parking space. This is a duplex on this parcel, and right now there's only a single um, parking space accessible from a shared driveway that goes up and behind to that parking space. Um, so this is a, a new, new, new driveway for a single parking space um, for that second uh, dwelling unit. Um, the, you know, you can go through my staff report and, and see where there's things in red. It really, my sense is all pretty much points to the same question that I had, which is what the actual width of the driveway is going to be. There's not a set amount in here for that. There's, it shows how much room there is, but it doesn't necessarily confirm that the driveway is going to be that full width. Um, but that's something that could be dealt with with a condition um, where applicant and Department of Public Works agree on that final width, and I have to have a, a final site plan with that before the permit gets issued. So it's still, even though it's an issue, I don't see it as a huge issue, but I think that it's worth the DRB going through the staff report and looking at those items. Sure. Thanks, Meredith. So, so that's what we'll do. We'll, we'll hear from Tom Harris, the applicant, and then um, we will walk through our staff report to make sure that the different standards within our zoning are addressed. And we'll spend more time on the ones that have a few more questions so we can ensure that this meets our regulations. So with that, I'll turn it over to Tom Harris. If you'd like to tell us a little bit about your project, please. Sure. Thanks, Kate. And thank you, everyone, for um, taking this up for consideration. I appreciate it. Um, as Meredith, I guess what I'll, the main thing I wanted to point out is the reasoning behind the second driveway. And as Meredith pointed out, there's only one parking spot, <clears throat> excuse me, there for the two units. So this would give that one extra spot for the residents in the other unit who don't currently have an off street parking spot. And in addition, Charles Street is one of those streets that's on the you know, never park during the winter parking uh, ban thing. So that's another sort of reason why, you know, it assists with the, with the parking on that. Um, so that's the reasoning. I did go out and, uh, you know, it's in the right up there. Hopefully it's, it's mostly clear, but, you know, multiple times to take measurements, check the, the property boundary markers, and also with a, a survey that was in place as well, it looks pretty clear that, you know, there's no issues as far as, you know, the space that would be needed to, to put the, the parking spot in there. As far as what Meredith was mentioning about the width, I mean, I care, I guess, a little bit, but I, I don't care about the width as long as, you know, I just want the best chance for it to get approved is, I guess, what it would come down to on that. So, but that's kind of... Yeah, that's just a quick, quick overview. Okay, thanks. That's that's helpful. As we're, um, I appreciate the drawings included with your application. Um, thank you for those. So um, one thing I'm going to pause before we continue, and I see that um, Daniel Sagan has joined us. And I, hello, welcome. Um, are are you interested in commenting on the Seven Charles Street application, Daniel? Okay, so I won't swear you in for this one, but we'll we'll revisit that when we get to our next one. Thanks for being here. All right, so um, what we're gonna do is go through the staff report, um, starting with, um, oh, and, and Tom, did you receive a copy of the staff report? Um, is that, well, I have a, the packet for tonight's meeting. Is that what you mean or? That's it, yep, it's the nine page document. Okay, that, yes. Okay. Yep. Um, Thank you. Yeah, so that goes through all the different standards there to meet. So let's just start with our general standards. On page three, we have um, dimensional standards for accessory structures and uses. And from your application, we see that you're not um, expanding the building or changing the use of the building in any way. But we do have a coverage standard as to how much of the lot can be covered with a building or with a driveway. And um, the coverage maximum is 60%, um, so about 3,400 square feet is the maximum that you could, you could have. Um, for the staff report, 
Um, current coverage is about 2,500 square feet, which leaves 800 or 900 square feet to available. Um, and that's where the question about the width of the driveway comes in, in part. If the width is 13 feet, that would be 322 square feet of additional coverage, which is still well below um, 3,400. Um, so even if the driveway width was 15 feet, you'd probably, you'd still be under that number. Um, so you said that you're, you're, I guess I heard you say you're flexible as, as to the width, but based on your, your thinking and the vehicles that are present at your duplex or maybe in the future, is there an optimum width that you want to design for and have approved? We, we, we aren't um, very well suited as a board to make suggestions or to design the project, um, but we will evaluate your request. Okay, sure. Well, I, I would say 12 feet. And I guess, you know, that might come down to also when, if I was fortunate to get to that point when, on execution, if, you know, something worked a little bit better with, um, you know, the professional that was do, doing the work. Um, but I'll throw out 12 feet as, as optimum. Okay. So we'll, we'll proceed with review of a 12 foot wide um, second, second driveway. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. Um, Thanks. So this we'll, we will clarify this in the permit. Um, I'm looking at the staff report. I have another computer screen here. That's why I'm gazing off into the distance. Um, yes. So we'll just want to see that reflected in a final plan to the zoning administrator before the permit is issued. So that could be a, a condition. Um, do other board members have uh, questions or about this um, standard? No. Okay. I'm going to move through the um, other general standards. They mostly don't apply. They are 3004 demolition, 3005 riparian areas, 3006 wetlands and vernal pools. Those are not present on the site. 3006 steep slopes, which are not triggered by this um, application based on where the driveway is going to be. 3008 erosion control. Um, our standard is that any projects need to comply with the best practices for erosion control in our um, zoning bylaw. That's just kind of, that's a standard part of constructing a project, but you don't need to do a professional erosion control plan for this project. Um, similarly, stormwater management, there have been no concerns expressed about the storm changes to the stormwater, no major changes to the site or concerns from the Department of Public Works. So um, are there questions about any of those standards and whether, uh, do, do, do DRB members need any more information to understand how those do or don't apply to this project? Okay, thank you. So next is access and circulation. And this is section 3010 of the zoning. And it's the place where we have, where it calls upon the DRB to review the second access in the first place. So that, that's, that's why we're here for this. And our standard is that um, a lot may be served by only one access point, except that the board may approve more than one access on a lot when necessary to accommodate unique physical conditions on the property to provide adequate emergency access or to provide adequate traffic circulation within the site. So we heard that this is to accommodate the um, one half of the duplex. Um, and it sounds like one of the unique, something I might characterize as a unique physical condition is that your existing access is shared with 11 Charles Street. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes, that's correct. It's it goes back many years ago with um, it's you know in the write up, and when the property was transacted a year and a half ago, they kind of tweaked that. The owners, the previous owners at seven, and then mm -hmm. the current owners at eleven. Mm -hmm. um, so it's shared, and they have the property line kind of cuts right along their building, and they have a uh, sort of in the basement an entry exit way. So as they come out of that, they're kind of 
you know, in the driveway property. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really, they wanted to keep it that way. And it's important for them to at least have access around, you know, in that area. So, um, that's probably the, the biggest thing. Okay. Yep. Is that part of what makes it difficult to accommodate both, um, tenants up from the duplex with the single driveway? Or is there simply not space? Um, well, yeah, the single driveway is, so only accommodates one, one vehicle. You technically could fit two vehicles front to back, but it's really not feasible because the driveway narrows as it gets up higher. Mm -hmm. And if, if you did that, it would be <laughs> um, quite a mess with, with snow removal and buildup. And then also just taking um, the garbage and the recycles down. You couldn't get by with, with another vehicle there for that. So there's not only that, it's actually in the write up that two vehicles can only be parked there, you know, at certain times. That's kind of the agreement with the, the other, the people that share it with. So it's really a one spot uh, driveway. Um, okay. So. Thanks. Thanks for that description. Um, I would note that shared access between adjacent properties is strongly encouraged in our zoning bylaw. So you are already doing that. <laughs> so you're certainly meeting a one goal of, of the zoning. Um, um, DRB members, would you like to know more about, um, a, in order to help you decide whether this is necessary to accommodate unique physical conditions, provide emergency access or adequate traffic circulation? No, I think it's pretty straightforward, Kate. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Um, the next standard having to do with access and circulation is spacing, and that requires certain uh, amount of footed linear feet between driveways, and those minimum uh, requirement distance requirements are met with the proposed new driveway, so that standard is met. Um, <clears throat> so, the only other issue, and this is a blue highlight, not a red highlight, so it's, you know, <laughs> um, is from Department of Public Works um, and the desire for clarification around where the public right-of-way line is for this project. And I wonder if there's been further clarification of that question between the applicant and the department or whether, Meredith, you've worked with DPW on that. If, what can you tell us about that? I, I, I couldn't quite absorb it as I was... I, I couldn't. I didn't. I couldn't quite tell where we landed on that. Uh, Tom, do you want me to talk about this for a second? Sure, that would be great. Thanks, Meredith. So I, I I'm sorry I didn't. It, it was hard to explain and not just reiterate everything that was in the emails. Um, but it when Corey was looking at it from Department of Public Works, Corey Line, um, I think he felt like it was really really important to have. A, a clear measure from the middle of the public right of way as to where that line fell. But we do have a survey. The survey shows that the public right of way is in line with the pins and Tom found the pins. And so it seemed to me like maybe Corey was looking at a, a bigger picture that didn't really matter in this instance, given that we have, I don't, it was more than sufficient length from that pin, um, you know, over 20 feet from that pin space, you know, almost 23 feet. If you look at that exhibit three, which is on page 27 of the um, packet mm -hmm. to get a 18 and a half foot long parking space in there, that's all the room that we need is to get a car out of the public right of way. Um, so I'm, I'm, it looked to me like there's enough information here for the board to make a decision okay. um, without us having, without, you know, Tom having to go through and remeasure where the right of way is based on the middle of the road. Cause we, we don't, we have a survey. Fair enough. It's okay. a URB if they, you know, if they feel like that there's not enough information, it can be resolved by having a final site plan that's DPW approved prior to the permit issuance. 
Okay. Um, if anything, this is surprising us because we don't often, we don't always have a survey that gives us decisive information about where the right of way ends. So we're, we're confused by something having been done right. <laughs> no. Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of joking, but um, it's, it's really just that simple, I guess. Um, does anyone have a question or comment about this? Well, I just would, uh, yeah, reiterate that I think it is, uh, you know, very uh, crystal clear. And, uh, you know, as long as the landowner truly believes that the pin you found is the one that's there, uh, I see no issue at all. Okay. Thanks, Rob. And Kevin? Yeah, just a quick one. Uh, what is the uh, material that's going to be used for the uh, second driveway? Um, so that's not in the in the write up, and right. I'm not. It would not be like a a hard, totally uh, membrane down. It would be like sort of a semi impervious uh, material. Um, I'm not sure what it, I don't have that, but I could come up with that very quickly if, if you need that i think i think it's i think it would be helpful to have <clears throat> so we know i mean obviously if it's if okay. it's standard asphalt that that creates a, a potential sheeting effect uh during a storm uh whereas you just mentioned a uh, semi permeable I mean, I'd, I'd like to know what that would be mm -hmm. kevin is this okay. awesome? Is, is the, I, I'm looking back at um, the, the evidence on 3009 stormwater management and um, the finding that it's additional impervious surface, but not a significant quantity and with stormwater flows not changing significantly. With that in mind, would that, that would that would be adequate, actually. But I guess uh, just from a um, just to fill out that issue. Uh, I, I, I would like to know what the material is going to be, but okay. thank you, Kate. That's, that's a good clarification. It's not a matter of, of, uh, that being by itself uh, a significant factor, but yeah. I think it's an ancillary factor. Sure. I think it's still, um, always good to know kind yes. of how we're so developing our site. So I appreciate the right. question and perhaps when the final site plan is submitted with the final width of the driveway, you could indicate on that site plan, the material that you intend to use for record keeping purposes. Um, that would be that would be fine, Tom, if you could do, do that. And that way you don't have to decide right this second okay. what to build with. Okay. All right, great. Um, all right, so I think that brings us through the staff report. Um, do DRB members have any other questions uh, or information they would like to gather in order to contemplate whether this application meets the zoning requirements. Okay. Um, as I mentioned, alluded to at the beginning of the meeting, we have been taking our um, discussion about decisions into executive session, or it's not um, deliberative session, not executive session. That's a very specific different thing. Deliberative session is what we have been using uh, in order to uh, deliberate thoughtfully and come up with appropriate conditions um, in the Zoom environment. And we've been doing this for all applications. So our decision to go into deliberative session does not reflect on anything that's good, bad, or otherwise about a given application. It's simply our process for the last several months. Um, so that said, I will take a motion to enter into deliberative session on 7 Charles Street at the close of the public hearing, the public portion of the meeting. So moved. Did Hold I get on. that wrong, You missed one little thing. So to close the public hearing on this matter and move into deliberative session after the close of the public meeting. Thank Something you. Like that, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. We in our meetings, we have a hearing. We have hearings on different applications and those are separate things that are within the public meeting. So thank you. Thank you for clear clarifying that. It feels like that magnetic poetry on a refrigerator just changes. <laughs> um, if we don't close the public hearing, then technically you you're still taking testimony and that's not right. what you're doing. That's right. Let's do it right. So the mo I would I would entertain a motion to um, enter into deliberative session or close the public hearing on this matter and enter into deliberative session on 7 Charles Street at the close of the public meeting. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. Motion by Kevin. Second. 
Motion. Second by Jean. Thanks, Jean. Um, is there any discussion? All right, I'll call the roll. Roger. Yes. Abby. Yes. Kevin. Yes. Jean. Yes. Michael. Yes. Uh, Rob. Yes. And I also vote yes. So we've closed the public hearing on this application. We will deliberate this evening and then issue a written decision um, about your project. So uh, thank you very much for being here, sharing information, um, submitting the materials you did uh, and participating in the process. You're welcome to stay for the subsequent application or, or move on with the rest of your day. <laughs> Okay, great. Thanks, Kate, and thanks everyone um, on the board and, and Meredith. I appreciate it, and have a good evening. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks. All right. So next, we are moving on to an application at One West Street. This is a change of use application. The use being contemplated is a conditional use. And we will also be undertaking, so we will be undertaking conditional use review as well as minor site plan review. Um, I'm pulling up my documents here. Um, what I would like to do is, uh, if there's anyone here to be heard on this matter or who thinks that they might like to speak later on this, what I will do is swear you in. Um, and in order to do that, uh, there you go, please raise your right hand. Um, if you're going to speak on this matter. And please, if you're going to speak on this matter, unmute yourself so that we can okay. hear you. So Kate, I believe Katie and Daniel so far. I see other, other folks here Justin. who are not unmuted. Uh, Justin. Okay. Um, thanks. I'll go for it now. Um, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury? I do. Yeah. I do. Great. Thank you. So I'm just going to note, um, uh, Katie is the applicant, and Justin and Daniel are two folks who will be uh, interested in speaking um, on the matter. So what we'll do is very similar to what we did with our last application. I'm going to turn to Meredith for a brief overview and then turn it over to the applicant, to Katie, to, to speak a little bit about the project. Um, at that point, I may ask if the um, if people attending to speak want to have specific things that they want to speak on that could be done during our review of the application or want to give an overview statement. We'll, we'll, we'll decide that in, in a second, okay? Um, but you will have a chance to speak. So I'm going to uh, hand it to Meredith. Um, okay, so this is an application um, by the Vermont College of Fine Arts to add a new use at One West Street, um, which is the Dewey Hall. And it's the food service contractor use. So it's, it, they already use that space for serving the students um, and other other entities who might, might um, lease the space. I know it's one point, um, uh, Necky was also using the kitchen for its students. Um, but because this is a situation where somebody would be coming in and cooking food there, but then taking it somewhere else, so it's like a catering service, um, it becomes the food service contractor use, um, even though it's still just using the kitchen to prepare food. Um, so that food service contractor use is a conditional use in the mixed use residential zoning district. Because it's a conditional use, it has to come here to the development review board. Um, you know, I, I don't think there's a whole lot more to my overview that doesn't get so detail oriented that we're getting into zoning regulations specifics. So I'm going to hand it back to Kate. Great. Um, thanks. Thanks for that good overview. Um, I will hand it on to Katie um, to present briefly on the project before we go into reviewing the standards and the staff report. So Katie, please. Sure. Thank you, Kate and Meredith. Um, so uh, I forget exactly how long ago it was, maybe a month or so ago, Justin Turcott reached out to me um, with a question about uh, our kitchen capacity. Justin has been um, providing meals for homeless and elderly throughout the pandemic by way of 
Um, I believe originally it was a federal grant. Um, I think it now may be a state grant. He could probably speak more accurate, uh, accurately to the funding sources. Um, and uh, I was really interested in the conversation because we have been remote since last March. So our kitchen um, really has had minimal um, <laughs> operation. And so we certainly have capacity for this. Um, not to mention potentially long-term um, partnership opportunities. So um, as a result of that, uh, Justin and I had several meetings with our culinary director, Mike Deweese, and we all decided this was something that was worth um, pursuing to see um, if we could make it work. Justin, is there anything else you would add? Did I miss anything important about your funding or more background you'd like to add? No, that sounds great, Katie, unless the board wants to hear anything else. Great, thanks. Yeah, thanks, that's, that's a good overview. It's always good to know sort of the backstory behind um, behind these projects, though I, I will just remark that um, our purview is is limited to the, basically to the, to the impacts. Of, of the project, but I sure like hearing about what's going on in town. So, so thanks, thanks for that. Okay, so um, what we're going to do is we're go we're going to walk through walk through the staff report and the items that have been flagged for us to consider have to do mostly with um, access and circulation. So comings and goings from the site, how it might affect. Um, parking for students at the dormitory when classes resume on campus. Um, that, so that that is the type of impact that we one of the impacts that we will be looking at. Um, so that's going to be an item for discussion. Um, most of it has to do with access and circulation, so com comings and goings. Um, and parking and loading is a part of that. So how, how will people move around within the site and how will parking work once, once it's in operation? Skimming my notes here, thanks for bearing with me. So, um, so before we go into the staff report, um, let, let me just kind of uh, survey um, of the folks who are here to, to speak on this, which I believe is um, Daniel. Um, is there one specific issue you wanna speak about or is there like an overarching comment you'd like to make, use your two minutes to make here at the outset, because sometimes questions are answered as we go through the staff report. But um, let me just ask you, Daniel, is there one, is there a specific area of interest that you have with this or just kind of a general, general here to comment? Today? I have a, I have a specific area of interest and I have a general comment. <laughs> okay. Would you like, how about you start with your general comment and we can incorporate your specific area of interest when we probably get to it in the staff report. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, actually, I live on on Thirty One First Avenue. Uh, the the property is actually a corner property on the corner of West Street and First Avenue, and our uh, our property abuts the the building lot that uh, the Dewey Hall building is on. In general, we absolutely support uh, what the organization that wants to use the kitchen is going to do. So we have no problem at all with the idea that that kitchen will be used to feed folks who don't have access to good food. So that's my general statement as a neighbor. We're fine with the change of use inside the building and we do not feel trepidation about delivery vans. Okay. And, um, can I may I ask about the nature of your specific comment so I can make sure we fit it in, in the right place? The nature of my specific comment can be addressed to the statement on page 13 of 13 of the staff report, which it would be uh, item 25, sub chapter A, sub chapter I, 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 where it says any additional cooking odors will be similar to those present when students are on campus. I would like to address the cooking odors when students are on campus. And there is, I'll address that when you get to it. Okay. I'll make sure 
to make space for that. Thank you. Okay. For helping me you. helping me plan the meeting. So um appreciate that, Daniel. Is there anyone else who, who is here to speak on this? I just I like to be a little extra sure, especially when we're talking to each other from boxes. <clears throat> All right. Then let's go ahead and um, move through the staff report. Um, if that's all right with board members. Yeah. Great. Okay, so um, we're going to start as, as we do. Um, there, there is some overview information here about some of the parcel and property history um, having to do with past, um, being subject in the past to a institutional PUD. I'm not going to get into that because it doesn't govern um, what we're doing. It's just some context. Um, people can ask questions about it later if they wish. So we're going to um, we're going to note we're going to start with overlay zoning districts on page four of thirteen of the staff report that this is in a design control overlay district, but we're talking about a change of use, not a change of the building, and so this does not um, this is exempt from design review. So then, moving on to the general standards. Um, the, as we heard from Meredith, the addition of the food service contractor is a conditional use, so we will evaluate it for its impacts under the conditional use review standards, not the general standards. Um, sections 3002 and 3003 are the dimensional standards, um, lot setback, density buildings, those things aren't changing. Um, similarly, standards related to demolition, riparian areas, wetlands and vernal pools, steep slopes, erosion control, and stormwater management. Um, none of those apply because the site is not being modified. But nevertheless, I will pause and see if DRB members have any questions. Okay, thanks. So that brings us into um, section 3010, access and circulation. And we discuss this because we want all of our developments to promote safe and efficient access to and circulation within a property for vehicular, bicycle, and pedestrian traffic. So um, the access to the site is not changing. Is that right? There's still, um, there's a driveway in today and it's going to be the same driveway tomorrow. So same width, same access point onto the parcel. Correct. Yes. Okay, thanks. So what is changing is that um, there will be a, a slightly a different volume or type of user of the site. And the application and the staff report indicate that that's about three vehicles um, that will be using the site and the parking. Um, and that how to put this, um, it's about 12 to 14 weeks a year that under under normal circumstances, students are on campus. Correct, and during those weeks, that's when our food service is fully operational. So it would be staff that would be using that lot. That lot is not a student parking lot, just as a point of clarification. Oh, thank you. I, I misunderstood that. And I think I misstated earlier in this meeting. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks for clarifying that. So that'll be a staff parking lot. Okay, so um, is it the case that um, when you're operational with, with your staff needing parking, will the food service contractor vehicles need to park on the street or will staff need to park on the street? Um, that would probably depend on who gets there first. Um, but there, there is plenty of street parking or additional parking lots. So we don't anticipate that being an issue. Okay. And maybe a, a, a question for Justin might be, um, if the delivery vehicles and the, if, if the, food, the, the vehicles that deliver food to the kitchen and take prepared food away, if they need to operate from parking spots in front of the building, what sort of impact, if any, does that have on the surrounding area? Uh, we would hope to utilize the seven existing parking spaces in the staff parking lot as they're closer to the loading dock and uh, that's what, kind of what they're designed for. Um, if we did need to use street parking, um, I think ideally, and maybe Katie can speak to this, 
we would be using other VCFA designated parking that was off street um, on other parts of the campus. But uh, in the event that we did have to put unusual circumstance, we would put a vehicle on the street. Um, I guess it would be like parking any other car. Okay. So uh, it sounds like you anticipate that it won't be necessary to park on the street for delivery purposes. That would be ex the exception rather than the rule at those times when students are on campus. Yeah, and Justin, help me make sure that I'm explaining this accurately. So Justin anticipates a maximum of three vehicles from his operation using that parking lot, one of which would be a van that would be doing deliveries. And I am imagining it would be parked and then it would pull up to the loading dock, it would get loaded and then it would leave. So I, just to sort of paint a picture of what that, that would look like. And Justin, does that sound accurate to you? So even if that van had to be on the street for some reason or in a different lot for another reason, it would still come to the parking lot, to the loading dock, be loaded and then leave. Yes, you're correct there. And I would also just add the perspective that uh, as a former instructor of the New England Culinary Institute, I had the pleasure of working at this facility for five years and I intimately understand uh, the importance of uh, not idling vehicles, uh, keeping staff, you know, uh, not making a lot of noise. We had a lot of students there. And so I, there are, there is signage up already uh, from before, but uh, we certainly want to be good neighbors and considerate of uh, all the people in the neighborhood. Okay. Great. So do um, board members have any other questions uh, about access and circulation? And uh, we're kind of blurring into section 3011 parking and loading areas. Michael, I know you pipe up when you when you need to, but I, I'll. Yeah, I'm good. Thank you, though, Kate. Okay, you're welcome. Great, so um, we'll move on to page seven of 13 of the staff report and, and confirm that we are addressing the standards of 3011 parking and loading. Um, so this this use has, as we've discussed, there's no regular customer traffic, it's not a retail operation. So comings and goings in that sense are very, very, or non-existent. Um, and we've talked about how there's a variety of parking options both on street and in other areas of the of the college um, to accommodate staff as well to accommodate staff when when um, school's in session. Um, we have a standard that projects that will receive regular deliveries or generate shipments by truck need to quote demonstrate that there will be adequate off street space for loading and unloading without interfering with traffic circulation access and parking um i think we've just discussed that are there any other questions about that standard okay um and can you confirm um katie or or even even justin from your previous work that the loading area has overhead clearance of at least 10 feet um it does. it does. It does. Okay. Great. Um, so the parking lot is not being redesigned significantly. It's just being utilized by a different set of vehicles. Correct. Okay. All right. Great. Um, so I will just note from our staff report and from the DPW's review of the application that with the on-street parking, with the alternate side parking in the winter, that may limit um, on-street parking. Does that uh, raise any, con d d does that newish approach to winter parking affect your confidence that you'll still have adequate parking? It does not, and we don't anticipate using street parking. Okay. Thanks. Well, I just had uh, one question about the, you know, delivery. So there's a sure, Rob, that, go ahead. Uh, that, um, you know, are owned by the, you know, college or the district. Rob, you sound, I'm sorry, Rob, you sound a little far away. Um, can you hear me better now? Yes, thanks. Okay. Um, so what about the food deliveries, like, from the supplier? Um, you know, the, not just the, um, you know, the vehicles that you will be operating, but the, you know, will it be big? 18 wheelers backing into that parking lot or whatnot. 
Sure, I can speak to this if that's all right, Katie. Sure, that's great. Thanks, Justin. Um, so we utilize about four different commercial vendors, um, but they can't, they know that they can't put those trucks there. They've been coming there for years for Necky. Um, and so they'll bring like a smaller box size truck. Um, and we also have signage up and the vendors are familiar and we'll be sure to enforce um, the, the deliveries cannot come before seven o'clock or after 6 p.m. Uh, there's also no idling signage already posted there. And so they understand that, um, you know, again, we want to be good neighbors and we understand we're in a semi-resident, we're on the edge of a residential area. And so um, we anticipate those trucks coming once or twice a day, turning off their engines in once they're inside the parking lot or they won't be blocking the street or any um, street traffic um, pulling up to the loading dock unloading and and leaving okay great thanks any other questions from board members okay so i think we've discussed access circulation parking and loading um Moving on to page nine, signs not applicable, no new signs are proposed. So that brings us through the general standards and we're going to talk now about the site plan standards. Um, this is a minor site plan approval and review. Um, section 32 of two is bike and pedestrian access and circulation. And um, it looks like there are existing sidewalks and internal walkways, and those will not be changed because of this use of change of use, right? Um, landscaping and screening. Uh, we require a landscaping and screening plan, except when there are changes of use on a site that's already developed in accordance to an approved site plan. And this site is already developed in accordance with an approved site plan. So the landscaping and screening um, requirement is either met or exempt. <laughs> it's, uh, you've done it. Um, outdoor lighting is not applicable because no changes are proposed. The same is true of outdoor seating, display, or storage. Um, solar access and shading does not apply because this is a minor site plan. Um, and design and compatibility is also a major site plan standard, so it doesn't apply here. Okay, um, I did that a little quickly, but are there any questions about the site plan standards? Okay, um, when the site doesn't change, the site plan often also doesn't change. So that stands to reason. All right, so that brings us to the conditional use standards. Um, this is where we'll get at, um, at performance standards like noise and, and odor. Um, so, First question has to do with um, the capacity of community facilities and utilities. Um, do you see this project as having a great impact on um, sewer, water, electricity, schools, parks, roadways? We do not. Okay. Um, one question from DPW had to do with how food scraps would be dealt with and we have testimony by email um, that VCFA believes its current holding capacity will accommodate the new use. That is accurate. That's correct. Great. Okay. Thanks. Just wanted to get that in the record. Um, do board members have questions about this category of impact? Yeah, Abby. I'm not sure this falls into this category, but I'm just wondering about volume. And if you anticipate, it sounds as if that the facility right now is not being used or being very underutilized, but do, do you anticipate that the volume of activity will increase over time and, and would then potentially impact um, city services and, and other you know, characteristics? You know, it's a great question, Abby. Um, so as I said before, we're, our, we're all remote right now. So definitely for the time being, no issue. Both Mike, uh, VCFA's culinary director and Justin have worked in this kitchen before. And so they know the capacity of the kitchen, which is quite substantial. And they feel confident that even, even if we got to the point where both um, operations were able to be working simultaneously, that we wouldn't, it would not, overwhelm the capacity of the kitchen 
Um, when we are fully, like our largest program is 110 students. And um, that kitchen was built for, um, I did the math previously, over 300 students. So we're never in a position where we're actually sort of producing for what that kitchen was was built for originally. Um, so I don't know if that has completely answered your question. Justin may have more to add, but please follow up with other questions. Sure, Abby, one other consideration is that um, with NECI folding up here in Montpelier, um, there used to be a lot of NECI students that would utilize that space for their food service needs and as a cafeteria. And so you've got anywhere from most recently 25 to up to several hundred NECI students in the past 10 years that have been living on campus and using that for their food service needs. So at the same time that we're able to bring food to people who need it in hotels uh, and through Everybody Eats, um, NECI is no longer here. So kind of add one, subtract one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, that, that helps. Thank you both. Sure. All right. Um, we're going to move on to the conditional use standard of traffic, section 3303. And we've, we've discussed already um, the expected volume. And just to confirm, it sounds like I, I think I heard two to three delivery trucks a day going in. To, is that correct? I would say maximum. Often, depending on volume, we may only get deliveries a couple times a week, but that would be the for certain the ceiling of, say, three trucks per day delivering and one to two trucks going outbound. Okay. And the standard we need to show is that there will not be an undue adverse effect upon the traffic in the area. And I would, um, this, this seems like a fairly minimal amount of coming and going. Yeah, Meredith. Uh, just wanted to flag for you that we have a new attendee, Chloe Wexler. So once she in and added to audio, I, I just want to make sure that we don't miss her. Okay. Um, great. I, I will pause. I see Chloe's unmuted. Welcome, Chloe. Are you? Hi. Good morning. Oh, oh good morning. Good evening. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> you made it. It's evening. I made it. Um, oh. I live in the neighborhood. I found the piece of paper and remembered that this was tonight and I decided to jump in and um, listen. Great, thank you. Thank you, Chloe. What I'll do, um, if, if you, do, you, do you think you might wish to be heard on this to add some testimony or comments? I don't have any comment that I will provide. I just wanted to listen. Okay, great. If that changes, please let us know. If uh, I swear in people who provide comments so I can do that, but if you just wanna listen, that is also fine. We're just going through the staff report and we have done much of that at this point. So Perfect. Thanks, for, thanks for signing on. Um, great, so we were just talking about traffic um, and the, do, um, do board members have any, any questions or concerns about traffic? No. Okay. Okay then, we're gonna move on to the character of the neighborhood standards. Um, again, the standard that we need to meet is does it have an undue adverse effect on the character of the neighborhood? Um, and we've heard that there, um, that some of this is comparable to what's happened in the neighborhood before. We know that the College Hill East Street neighborhood character description um, incorporates the campus of BCFA as well as historic homes along major streets. Um, proposed development should protect the historic character and appeal of this neighborhood while allowing for compatible infill development and adaptive reuse of older institutional and registered uh, residential structures. And then um, we've received testimony that there will be some additional light and noise from the additional van delivery and traffic um, with approximately three new vehicles in the parking lot for brief periods of time each day. Um, we heard that that won't happen before 7 a.m. or after 6 p.m. Most project noise will be within the building. Um, and here were um, any additional cooking order odors will be similar to those present when students are on campus and some increase in waste production will occur, but similar to, to what's produced when students are on campus. So um, first I'm gonna ask if board members have any questions about these items, and then I'm going to um, get back to, to Daniel, who is interested in speaking on this. 
Okay, so I'm going to have Daniel speak and then um, we may have more questions from the board or um, we, we can hear from the applicant. Um, so Daniel, please. So yeah, again, Danny Sagan, I live at 31 First Avenue, which is right next door to the property. And uh, I've lived here for a little over 17 years and have been through various iterations of owners and occupants of the building. Um, one thing that sort of occurs over time is twofold. Uh, often, um, or not often, there have been occurrences uh, where uh, members of the staff working in the kitchen have been smoking cigarettes in the space between the fire exit and our fence. And the smoke uh, goes into our yard and we've asked for this to change and it has been addressed in the past. And there are signs um, that say, please do not stay here and smoke. And there have been many staff members over the years who've understood this and have smoked on the corner of West and First or if, or smoked on the, the, the West Street side of the building. Uh, which has been very nice. Um, we find when the staff changes or the use changes, there's often one or two people who don't know of this uh, rule or accommodation for the property line. And when we remind them of such, or when we come across around the corner and we say, can you please not smoke there? They're very accommodating, but it takes our effort to get them to stop. Um, this also occurs uh, sometimes when there's outdoor dining and outdoor cooking. Um, there is uh, sometimes a barbecue, and I know that the preparation of meals for this new use uh, will probably not include barbecuing, but sometimes the barbecue, the smoke from the barbecue uh, floats into our backyard. And again, when we go around the, the hedge and say, could you please move the barbecue, it's all done very politely and accommodating, and, and there's really no issue there. But I guess... I appreciate Justin's comments that he said they want to be a good neighbor and that he's already aware of the signs. I just would hope that any new staff members who want to smoke be informed very early in the process where they're going to smoke. And if there's any need to cook outside, that it not be done uh, so that the smoke uh, enters our yard. And I would say that our yard is actually quite small and it's bounded uh, by the house. Um, and therefore it's sort of like an outdoor room. And once it fills with smoke, uh, it's, it smells like smoke. Um, so anyway, that is uh, my comment from the borderline uh, to the edge of my property and the Dewey Hall's property. Kate, may I respond? Yes, please, Justin. Danny, thanks for taking the time to come to this meeting. It's great to be able to hear from you directly, and and uh, you know, so you don't have to talk to people one after another. We, I think, we can certainly address this. I would just like a little more clarity on. You mentioned a fire exit, and I'm in my mind imagining the narrow strip of land, kind of on the back side of Dewey Hall, that comes out onto First Ave. Is that kind of the space where you don't want people to be? Yeah, let, just to be, you're, you're, you're correct. All right, so, so the space where people smoke is there's a, there's a, if you, there's the, if you, there's the, the first avenue side of the property. If you traverse along the property line between my property line and Dewey Hall's property line, there is sort of an alleyway and included in the alleyway is a fire access out of Dewey Hall, but also a short flight of steps that goes into the cafeteria entrance of Dewey Hall. And there's sort of also like a bit of an alleyway to the parking lot where the dumpsters are and the loading dock is. So there's sort of a space there that's that one could best describe as an unpaved alley, or maybe it even, even has concrete paved for part of it. Um, and it becomes a hangout space because, you know, it's, a, it's out of the wind and the uh, there's a bit of a picket fence that also is on the property line and, and it's, you know, it's a delightful place to have a cigarette. Um, the only problem is that due to the thermal patterns of, of the site, all the cigarette smoke goes into our yard. Um, so does that, that makes it clear to you in your mind where that spot is. There's also signs that say, please do not hang out here and please do not sit here and please do not loiter here. Um, there are signs that actually say it so that you can't have a cigarette and not see the sign. 
Yes, I'm clear on where the space is. I just wanted to confirm it is where I thought it was. Uh, we do have a couple smokers on our staff and I will make sure they don't, they haven't been back there, but I'll make sure they know that. And then additionally, as, um, as we start to resume residencies, if we see folks coming out of the cafeteria and maybe using that space, we'll try to politely let them know that there are other, plenty of other spots on campus where they can go so that, that their fumes don't, you know, come into your living space. Uh, and also with barbecues, Thank you. I appreciate that. We don't light, we, we will not be lighting them back there. Um, and any fumes, you know, we'll, we'll do our best to be a good neighbor to you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Great. Thank you both. I'm glad we could, glad we could, um, air those concerns. No pun intended. Um, so, um, I, I will clarify that those, those are types of things that are unlikely to uh, be part of the permit or conditions to the permit, but this venue is a completely appropriate place for people to get together and talk about uh, what changes to the neighborhood mean. So, so thanks for, thanks for doing that constructively. Um, all right. So we've talked about some of the character of the area standards, including um, odors and waste production. Um, the last couple things on the character of the area are um, architectural compatibility, which the architecture is not changing, so we can assume that a standard is met. And same is true for yards, lot coverage, and landscaping. Um, so do board members have um, questions that they, do, do board members want to ask questions to get additional information about character of the area and whether there, whether and how there will be impacts? Feel free to ask them now. Okay. All right, I see Kevin Kevin is, is rejoining us and we've just completed the review of the character of the area standards, Kevin. Yeah, I'm sorry, um, I, I just, everything just crashed, so I'm just getting back on now. Okay, thanks, thanks for letting us know. Sorry for the crash, um, but you persevered. Um, These things happen. They do, they do. They, they could happen more, Thank, thankfully we're, we're pretty lucky. Um, okay, so, at that, we've, we've been through the standards. Um, do folks have any, uh, I, I will put it to board members if, if, there, if there are any final questions or comments about anything in the application. Yeah, Roger. I just have a question of interest uh, for, for uh, Katie or Justin. Um, how many uh, meals do you prepare uh, a day, Justin? Sure, uh, the current, state contract has us preparing today we made 111 meals for distribution in the northeast kingdom uh, but i would add that we we will pr we reduce that number of meals seven days a week um the state contract uh, was written to allow some flexibility depending on demand for these meals uh, for people who are cold and need to come out inside or are having domestic problems or our first responders or a variety of other reasons that people may need to quarantine for COVID or they don't have the situation at home where they can do so safely so that these hotel rooms are available to them. Um, so we're anticipating between 700 and 900 meals a week um, that are being delivered to five or six sites um, mostly in the Northeast Kingdom right now. Um, additionally to that, we just finished up a contract with Everyone Eats, which was uh, much closer to home here in central Vermont in Montpelier on Barry Street and in Barry City for the Salvation Army and the Good Samaritan House. Um, also uh, serving um, healthcare facilities where there were um, pop-up breakouts where they needed uh, their food service team had to collapse because of uh, uh, quarantine requirements so that they were able to continue to serve their populations. Um, that was a, a roughly an approximate number of meals per week varying from 800 to 1200 meals per week. Um, as you may or may not know, that funding for that program has ended at the end of the calendar year, but we are anticipating and looking forward to uh, resuming being able to participate in that program uh, should we be invited and that funding is resumed. So I guess that would put us somewhere in the 2,000 units per week range. Oh, great. Thank you very much. Great work. 
right. Thanks. Any final questions? All right. Well, thank you for walking us through that project and answering some questions and concerns. Um, as I noted before, we um, we conduct our deliberations in a deliberative session that is a private session um, in order to reach better better outcomes, conditions, and conclusions um, than are possible to do smoothly on Zoom otherwise. <laughs> and that is what we hope a, a temporary um, a temporary thing, but something we are doing for all applications now, um, just regardless of complexity. So we will do that. Um, this evening and issue a written decision. So with that said, is there a motion to close the public hearing on this application and move into deliberative session at the conclusion of the public meeting? Okay, I move, I, I, uh, I move that. Motion by Kevin. Second. Second by Abby. Any discussion? All right, I'll call the roll. Roger? Yes. Abby? Yes. Kevin? Yes. Jean? Yes. Michael? Yes. Rob? Yes. And I also vote yes, so we will enter deliberative session on this matter at the conclusion of the public meeting. Um, thank you all for, for participating. Appreciate seeing you here tonight. Um, and we'll be in touch very soon. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks. Good night. Thank you. Great. So we'll move on to item nine of our agenda. Oh, sorry, Danny. I was just saying thank you. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> Good night. Thank you. Um, item nine, our next meeting is Tuesday, January 19th, owing to the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday on Monday the 18th. And as usual, our meeting will be at seven o'clock on Tuesday the 19th. Um, so what we have next is um, board member and public comments or discussion regarding the use of deliberative session for every application discussion. When we started doing this probably in September or October, um, it was a new thing. We, um, my, my proposal was that because it was new, we should treat it as a, a pilot. Um, to see how it helped or hindered our operation as a board using Zoom during COVID-19. Um, and so I asked Meredith to put a note in the calendar for the new year so that we could review and discuss this as a group. And um, she did, and here it is. Um, so this is our opportunity to talk, and in including to get Meredith's feedback on um, how this has been working whether we think it is um, serving our process, serving the public, um, and ensuring better decisions. Um, so I would uh, open open it up to a discussion. Well, I guess in general, I would just say I, I think it. <clears throat> I think for the limited use of during the pandemic, that it makes perfect sense. And we're making no discrimination between the really complex project and the really simple project. Everything is on an equal footing. Uh, we're not getting caught in that sort of twist, twist and shout that we sometimes do about, well, should we go into deliberative session on this or not? We, we've already we we're just removing that as a, as an as a as an issue. And uh, even in some of these, which it seems like it would be a no brainer just to say to to vote. Um, uh, I think that uh, by doing it on the in the blanket way we're currently doing it uh, just eliminates any of that uh, kind of conflict. I also think that um, that you know in that fine day when when the sky's clear and we're allowed to uh, act like real human beings again, um, uh, it'll be great to go back to to the old you know uh, system of. Uh, deciding at that time if it requires deliberative session. Mm -hmm. That's my thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Kevin. That's that that's how I feel too. Roger. I I do too. I, I think Kevin said it well. Um I think as a general rule it's good to do deliberations in, in public. 
uh, from yeah. my experience on the on the DRB. Um, but that's really tough um, with this uh, with this funny medium, and I think everything Kevin said is very sensible and uh, prudent. Thanks. Um, would we received any feedback from anybody about the public? You know, from the public as to whether this is working, not working. No. I, yeah, I haven't had anybody comment to me either way, either applicants or anybody else after the fact. I mean, we also, if, if an applicant is coming to me the next, you know, one or two days after saying, hey, what happened? We haven't had any situations where we've had to, you know, do multiple deliberative sessions or anything like that. I've been able to tell them, look, you know, you got a yay or an A, we're just trying to, you know, I've, I've got to pull together the, the decision. We haven't had any weird surprises or anything because it's been really clear and I think you all have been really good about really being clear for the applicants about where what what possible conditions might be coming out of a decision. Um, so I think as long as that continues, I, I don't think anybody's going to have an issue. I mean, it's not delaying the written decision, any problems with it. It was definitely an improvement with the going into private session and not keeping the public waiting for us to get back to the meeting. Yeah. Just, and for us too, it, was just, it became such a time saver and, uh, and a relief for, the, for those waiting. So mm -hmm. that was a good call and I think this is a more comfortable way for all of us to, to do it with this such improvement. Yeah. Thanks, Jean. I think for, for those who weren't here, what Jean may be referring to in part is there were a couple situations where we went into deliberative session and kept the public meeting open. So the public was waiting for us to return and say what had happened. And that um, I that made the put a lot of pressure on the deliberative session and asked a lot of the public's time um, and created some uncertainty for the public um, having to wait. So yeah okay michael rob any any thoughts yeah i mean i think for some of the simple applications i do wish there was a way we could just decide on the spot but uh you know i, I think that given the situation we're in just doing it for all every single one is you know makes sense like it's been said and, um hopefully we're we're not in this for for that much longer <laughs> okay michael any thoughts uh, no, I, I don't like Zoom or the pandemic, and I'll leave it at that. But, you know, we do what we have to do, I guess. That's, that sums it up. Good editorial no, like... comment, Michael. <laughs> For the record, we don't like the pandemic. That is, that, I'll second that. <laughs> I'll roll. Um, no, okay. Well, um, we've had we've had a good discussion about this, and one of the things I want to emphasize is that we we agree that this is a this continues to be a temporary approach to our work, that it is something we will stop doing, um, unless circumstances change dramatically. It's something that we will stop doing when we resume meeting in person, and that um, even though sometimes it feels like it would be very easy to just make a decision on the spot, we're going to, for the sake of consistency, we're going to keep. Yeah. Um, discussing all applications, making voting on all applications in deliberative session um, so that there's no hemming and hawing about which which to vote in public and which not. Um, does that capture what we talked about? Okay. Very good. Um, so now with that, I'll accept a motion to adjourn. But before I do that, um, I want to ask Meredith if she is going to send us a Zoom link to the deliberative session. I did at 8.09, so people should check their emails and let me know if they did not get it. Abby, especially. Because <laughs> you seem to have problems getting my email, although the last time it worked out okay. And of course, I forgot to do a read receipt. No, oh, I don't see anything. I don't, I don't see, either. I don't either. Yeah. yeah, Meredith. I don't have it's not just me. <laughs> not tonight. Oh, not tonight, it isn't. Did it's the weirdest it? thing. I did. It is in my sent folder at 8.09 p.m. I don't have it. <laughs> not, not, not here. Sorry. I don't have it. 
Oh, uh, man. Okay. Um, is that, okay. Uh, hold on. Can we just stay on this? So, so. Um, yeah, it... That is so bizarre. Would you be willing to try again while we're on the line here? Yeah. Oh, no, for sure. For okay. sure. I just got to open that back up. So give me a minute. No problem. Sign back into Zoom. I'm glad we checked before we all hung up. Meetings. Collaborative session. Let me try it a different way. I'm going to try to invite you instead. And I'm just going to send it to all DRB members, whether you're here or not. I'll try this. So you should be getting a, a calendar invite to your emails. Mm, okay. Titled DRB Deliberative Session. Unless, of course, like the city email all went down or something. Mm -hmm. In which case, I'll log into my personal email and send it to you. Yeah, if you, if you prefer, you could also send it to just, well... One of us. Hey, that I'm going to teach you if you want to try and forward it. If, if um, that would be easier. Abby is vindicated. <laughs> <laughs> Not the only one missing out. Kate. Okay. All right, give me a second because I got to pull up Kate's. Is there any other other business? I think the deliberative session is our other business. All right, Kate, I just sent it to you from my Gmail account. Okay. Let me take a second to refresh here. I sent it to your Gmail. There it is. Okay, so if you can forward it to everybody else, that would be great, because for some reason my work email is freaking out. Okay. Yeah, something seems to be going on with that today. Yeah. The, the whole server when I was trying to get onto the documents was right. a little funny. Well, thank you for letting me know that. I will make a note and um, reach out to our tech people tomorrow. Although, Kate, you got my email. I, I got an email from you at 6.53. Yep, yep. That was working. Yeah. All huh. right, so I've got Abby, Roger, Meredith, Rob, Jean, Kevin, Michael, Am I forgetting someone? Okay, I'm gonna send along this invitation. Let's confirm receipt and then we'll um, we'll, we'll adjourn this meeting and um, move to the other. Okay. okay. Let me know if that arrived. Not yet. I just got it from you, Kate. I got it. Are we good? Unfortunately, not I. That's okay. Okay, let me try again.
Wait, I could just walk up to your house and get a slip of paper that has yeah. the, just come in and walk back to my house. And then... That'd be fine. Okay, it looks <laughs> looks like I've got it. Okay. <laughs> I've got the link. I'm gonna try to to load her, load her, load it up. Okay. So I said anybody who has gotten the link, you can get off of here and go get on the other. Uh, uh, do a motion to adjourn? We do need a motion to adjourn. And Abby, hey, can, love and trouble. Can you send it to my work or my personal? I'll, I sent it to your personal. I'll send it to your work. Oh. Okay, you could send it to work too. Okay, here it comes to to work. Okay. All right. Are we ready to adjourn? Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Motion by Rob. Second. Second by Roger. Call the roll. Roger. Yes. Abby. Yes. Kevin. Yes. Looks like Jean's already gone. Um, Michael. Yes. Rob. Yes. And I also vote to adjourn. The meeting is adjourned. See you in deliberative session. Thank you.